I started with um, the book, Find Online Teaching Jobs Now. And those of you that just logged in, you're going to be getting a free copy of this book, and you'll get that link to that email after the webinar. This is the overview of the five sections I'm going to be covering today. And um, now I'm on the first section, which is getting prepared, getting yourself prepared. <clears throat> okay, so learning disabilities, strategy, speech, ed tech training, elementary science, information literacy, library, so science education. So you can see everybody has um, a subject matter expertise. In your preparation to get ready, that's what you wanna highlight in your materials. Um, it's not so much the online teaching piece, and that's important, but it's really people want subject matter experts first. That's the most important piece. And so make sure that that piece really shines through. Don't get too bogged down in the, do I have the skills to teach online? Um, where you live. I often get questions about, um, can I teach in another state if I live in one state? Um, do I have to teach at a university near me? In higher ed, as long as you live in um, the United States, and this can be country by country, but as long as you live in the United States, um, most universities will hire you. It doesn't matter where you live. Uh, people really don't care. The only time where it might come into question um, is um, if they want you to come in for an on-site interview. If they do, it gives you a sign that the person that's interviewing you isn't really comfortable with the online environment. That's actually an opportunity because you could take some leadership with it to set up the online um, webinar, but normally it doesn't matter where you live. At the K-12 level, if you want to teach K-12, it, it does matter, um, usually because of licensing. Um, it can matter, and your state has to has, have reciprocity with your teaching credential. Um, so don't worry about where you live. If you live internationally and you want to teach in the United States, you may run into issues. Um, and that's because the employer that's hiring you has to go through the visa paperwork, hiring in an international candidate. Um, it's a hassle for them. Um, from an HR perspective. And so that becomes a lot harder um, uh, to, unless you set that up in advance somehow. It is done. I've hired people out of the country, but I often struggled with HR to do that. So um, that's the where you live question. Um, advanced degrees and certification, like do I have to have a degree in ed tech? Hey, Sherry, good to see you. Like Sherry, do I have to be an expert in ed tech and um, online learning uh, in order to teach online and, and higher ed. No, actually you don't. As long as you um, have a bachelor's, and here's how it works. If you have at least um, a bachelor's degree um, and often a master's degree, preferably, you'll be able to teach at the undergrad level. And to teach at the graduate level, you at least have to have a master's degree and more frequently um, a PhD. A lot of programs are looking for, um, like in our program, we had a professional graduate certificate. So I would hire people with just a master's degree um, because it was that master's post-baccalaureate level program. And I wanted practitioners. I wanted people out in the field actually doing the work because it was a professional certification. So it really depends on the degree. But okay, so having said that, now um, imagine that I'm an employer, right? And I've got a job ad up and I'm getting resumes in and let's say it's for a, a science educator. And I've got one resume here with this great science educator background in higher ed. And then I've got a second resume over here with a great background in, in science education, but they also have a certificate or a coursework or something related to online learning or online teaching or online education or ed tech, any of that. Um, automatically as the employer, and I'm busy, right? I'm, you know, get your head like as the employer, I'm busy. And so in my mind, I'm like, yeah, that person's already been through training. I'm gonna take a deeper look at them. Like they may not make the cut ultimately, but I will instantly take a deeper look at them because that certification's there. It's almost like a, an external validation that there's been some level of vetting going on versus this person over here who may have experience teaching online, but I, unless it's really visible in the resume or the cover letter, often in the resume itself, um, I may not, get as much attention to it. So I do think advanced degrees and certifications 
um, can help. Sometimes they're required and, um, but always not necessary. I know many people who have been hired without certificates in online teaching, for example. And as we go, if you guys have questions, please feel free to um, type them in chat, comments, whatever. Um, I also wanted to talk about teaching part-time or full-time online and what does that look like. Um, employers um, always advertise for full-time teaching jobs. Those become more competitive. They're fully benefited. Um, they're, if, as a full-time online instructor in higher ed, they're, you're typically also going to be doing other things. Like you're going to have a teaching load, three courses, four courses a semester, and they want you to serve on committees, and they want you to chair masters or um, theses or dissertation committees, and they want you to advise. So the full-time online teacher job just is in online teaching. It's a full-time kind of faculty role. Um, and so you have to really think through, do you want that kind of a role? Is that really what you're looking for? And they're much more competitive. Um, the salary is about the same as it is for a regular faculty member, normally in a normal institution. Um, and there's, it's great because there's benefits that go with it. So if you're looking for that kind of role, that's what that looks like. The part-time role, um, there are a lot more of those opportunities. Usually there are um, one-offs where um, departments like have extra sections of courses they need or they've lost an instructor and they need to hire somebody or they're growing fast and they need some extra adjunct faculty really quick. And so they may hire you to teach one, two, or three um, online courses for one semester at a time. And in that case, you become... Um, usually an independent contractor, but our state of California, it's so hard to hire independent contractors now. Um, they're hired as employees, like part-time non-benefited. Uh, and so it'll be a limited contract, one semester at a time, teach one or two courses for a set amount of pay. Um, and, and that's a great supplemental opportunity. So if you have a full-time job and you're looking for extra money, the part-time gig is a great way to go. And it's a great way Let's say you're interested in full-time, but you've never taught online. Um, start part-time, teach for somebody part-time and get that experience. It's a lot easier than to shift into a full-time online role. Becky asked, is there a specific type of certification that's more beneficial to have than others? Where might one go to get these certifications? If it's specific to um, um, online teaching, Becky, I mean, there are certificates in online teaching, right? Um, or master's degrees in online teaching, or even PhDs in online teaching or online learning. Um, uh, you know, I used to teach at Boise State. They have a huge program certificate in online learning. Um, OLC, the Online Learning Consortium, or is it Educause? I think it's OLC, um, has a certificate program. Um, and that's if you want to go the teaching route. The design, online course design route is a different um, strand. And then I'm going to be offering a course in online teaching starting next week, actually, through um, USD. Um, and that's part of our new certificate, but our certificate is in educational innovation. Um, so I would, just, I would just do a search and kind of see, and you'll see reviews of programs. Um, you know, but there, there are some that have been around a long time. They're faculty research online education. That was Boise State, right? It was like every single one of our ed tech faculty were researchers in online learning. So it was state of the art. I mean, we were just really always pushing the field, you know? Um, knowing the tools and learning the lingo, obviously you have to know the tools. I'm gonna start with two basic tools you have to know, and then you can build your toolkit from there. And I did, an, I did a webinar um, two weeks ago, you can find it on our YouTube channel on online teaching strategies. I talk about your online teaching toolkit, but you have to know learning management systems. So if you've never taken a course online, like you don't know what an online course is like, you definitely have to register for an online course and, and have an experience in an online course. Um, obviously, right? It's going to be really hard for you to get your head wrapped around the online environment if you've never experienced it as a student. Um, and 
So learning management system or LMS, and those are things like Blackboard, Schoology, uh, Moodle, Canvas. And then the other piece, and that's, that's to support your asynchronous piece mainly. And the other piece you're going to have to know is a synchronous platform, and that's like webinar. Zoom, go to meeting, collaborate, um, whatever tool you might use. And sometimes the learning management system at the university you're going to will have an integrated um, a synchronous solution inside the LMS. That's great. They're all synced. Uh, what I would do is if I knew an employer, um, let's say I had a, a job interview, but somehow I got a job interview set up with Arizona State, right? You better believe I would be um, researching what LMS they use and I would try to get a guest account in that LMS and like work my way through it. So I understand that LMS. Most of the LMSs have the same functionality, um, but it's just really good to get familiar with the tools that the employer's learning. But yes, you do, Sherry. <laughs> Dissertation's everything. And then learning the lingo. There is a lingo in online teaching. I had a person, I wrote a book on, on online teaching strategies years ago, like that was 2007 or eight. Um, and she told me that she actually got hired. She got offered the job because she read my book and she had the lingo to talk about it in the job interview. I'm not selling my book because you can learn the lingo without the book. Um, and where do you get that lingo? So let me um, just share with you. There are online teaching standards, um, 4K12 for higher ed, and that's this one. This is this OLC, Online Learning Consortium Quality Scorecard. Um, if you search for that, or I'll send out these slides afterwards, this is hot linked. It's going to take you um, to this. This is the actual um, piece out of that scorecard. Um, it starts to give you the lingo, right? Um, just to be able to use terminology that sounds like you're knowledgeable about how to teach online, right? And so if I can say, and I know it sounds silly, but I don't know, I'm looking over here. No, I don't see anything in this one. Let me show you an example of one really quick. So let me escape. I've opened some things. Uh, let me go back to my browser. No, it's not letting me. Why won't it let me escape? Okay. Now, I was going to take you to this web page. There we go. Okay, this is the K-12 standards, but honestly, the, the lingo is similar, right? And so, and you guys can see this, right? I'm outside of the tool. I think I shared my Chrome browser. Oh, let me get my chat back up again. Yes, thank you. Okay, so when I go in and look at things like digital pedagogy, what is that, right? And so look at this, I mean, um, what does it mean to actually facilitate online learning? And not only does it give me the standards, but now it gives me some examples. It explains it to me um, and then gives me these examples. And so just, it would take you less than an hour, 30 minutes to read through some of these standards and pick up the lingo um, and write down some key phrases. Um, so you speak the language of online learning. Okay, so that's one tip that I can offer you. Um, just speaking the language of online learning. Okay, coming back to this. Um, a next tip I have for you is to please set up an online portfolio. So here's how I, um, I, I, I tackle, and I don't want to brag about this. I've honestly been offered every job I've ever applied for, as far as I can remember, except one. And that was at Cambridge University. <laughs> didn't get the interview, but I didn't get the job offer. Um, I always set up an online portfolio of me. Like this is me, Lisa Dolly, professional, my professional portfolio. It's just kind of a showcase of what I've done. You don't have to be a rock star. It's just what have you been spending your time um, doing? Yeah, they do look similar to ISTE standards, but they are a little more specific to um, – uh, fully online and in a lot of ways, if you look through them, Sherry. Uh, so I build my online portfolio on Wix. It doesn't matter what you use. Wix, uh, WordPress, uh, Google Sites, 
uh, something where you can, when you email in, please see my resume, in big bold letters, check out my online portfolio. It's like, this is how you show the person um, who you are visually instantly, right? And so again, I'm a busy department chair, I'm a busy person who's on the search committee. I just wanna visually look at something really quick that indicates to me that you've invested time, that you understand the digital environment. It's not hard to build in Wix. This is all drag drop text editing. I did no coding whatsoever. Um, I use a CV. I use a short CV, Sherry. And for those of you that don't know that terminology, it's curriculum vita, and I would just look it up online. It's basically a history of everything you've ever done. Um, but I've, I've been around for so long now, my full lead is like 40 pages. Um, and you have to use that if you're a full-time faculty member, gets turned in for tenure and things like that. Um, but for job hunting, I just create a shortened version of it. Yeah, right? 33 years of teaching, you have a lot of history and a lot of talks you've given and all that's um, in Avita. If you, Becky, if you go to lisadolly.com, you'll see this. And you can kind of um, click through it. And I actually think I brought it up here. So this is my site. Um, you can see it now. Don't feel like you have to have the um, things that I have here. I just put up what reflects me. Um, no, I don't put all my talks, Chelsea, at all. And if you notice in my online portfolio, I don't have my Vita and I don't have any of my publications because I'm not looking for jobs publishing anymore, right? So I've taken down that. Um, I'm trying to showcase who I am now as a professional. And so here, I'll go to my career page. You know, a little blurb where it started. Here's an article I wrote last year, three careers paths for the Ed Innovator. Just a little summary of my job experience, my education credentials, and then skills and stats. One of the things I've learned in the digital space, especially with online, um, number one, your eye scans everything. It scans, you don't read stuff. And so if the more concise you can make things, short, chunk it, um, this thing over here, I don't need to have my whole resume anymore. I've been around so long um, that unless I'm actually applying for a job, I don't feel like I need to put it online and you may want to do that. You know, I've got, um, an awards page. I don't know. Do I need this? I don't know. I'm proud that my peers have recognized um, some of the work I've done. So I leave it up there. Um, I include some sample projects that I worked on. If you've got video or you've got um, pictures, right? I can just scroll through some pictures of work, a little description about them. Um, this is all work I'm proud of. These are major projects I've engaged in over the last, let's see, Noah, maybe that was seven years ago, going back seven years, right? Kind of one per year. And then I included a video reel. Um, this reflects me because I tend to, I like making videos um, as I engage in the education work. And so maybe you're in um, science and you have science projects you want to showcase here, or you work in mathematics and you've given talks at conferences or online webinars and you want to showcase, right? Customize your um, portfolio to who you are and, and what needs to be here. Uh, but I would definitely, this sells it. This sells it. If, and I'm going to give you a, a strategy for really nailing that job and getting the search chair's attention. And it includes um, directing them to this online visual portfolio. So please um, definitely set that up, okay? Um, present. And again, if you go to Wix.com, it's simple, it's easy. It's, uh, you know, they give you the templates. This whole thing that I had with the floating bubbles, that was a template. I didn't build any of that. I just put my photo in and wrote some text. Okay. Sure, I think you could create a highlight reel anything if you've designed online course content if you sell lessons on teachers pay teachers if you have a blog that you maintain if you anything that shows your digital um footprint um and as an educator i would highly encourage you okay um now let's uh talk about how to locate jobs i'm going to give you five strategies for actually finding the jobs 
Um, number one strategy, two, I'm going to give you two great sites for job leads. And you probably already know these um, if you work in higher ed. And you'll notice my first one is going to be the Chronicle of Higher Education. Um, and I went there yesterday and pulled, I just searched on online teaching or something. I don't know when, you know, jobs came up. So let, let's go to the Chronicle really quick. Um, if you work in higher ed, almost every job ever posted in higher ed goes into the Chronicle um, in the job section. So let's go to the job section. And you can do keywords, right? And the one bummer about the Chronicle is they don't have like a remote, they do it state-based. So I don't even look state-based. I just leave it open. Um, but I could type something like online biology or online music or right, whatever. I would just search on keywords like that and kind of start to just what comes up. Oh, here's an online graduate wildlife lecturer, biology, full-time, non-tenure track. See, there's a full-time one. Nursing, adjunct, online. Adjunct will always mean um, part-time typically. Um, online adjunct, various disciplines, okay? So the Chronicle job sections is a must. Um, the other one that I would search is Indeed. Indeed will give you a little more, it will give you, um, higher ed, but it can bring in industry as well. And some industries like actually serve higher ed or they have a nonprofit training programs or things like that that may be interesting. So you can see the good thing about Indeed is I can actually search on remote um, on the where. And so if I just type up, you know, online instructor, it's going to be like everything, right? Coding, uh, to online English, uh, music, faculty, and it'll actually show you the salary. And I'm going to talk about salary in a minute. I find most, a lot of the things coming up on Indeed tend to be a little more K-12 focused um, than higher ed or industry focused like this um, Teeter Pal. It's probably an online tutoring company. Um, so those are the two that I would mainly focus on. There's a lot of other job search engines you can use. And if you guys know a better source, please share. Um, but those are those would be the ones that I would um, start with. Okay, let's go back to this. Um, identify college programs where you want to work. So this is strategy number two. Let's say that you live in South Carolina. Is Clemson University in South Carolina? Did I get that right? I know it's out there somewhere. Yes, yay, Joe. Okay, so let's say I live in South Carolina. Man, I really want to teach at Clemson, right? Like you're whatever. Or I taught at UNC Chapel Hill. I really am a Tar Heel, man. I want to teach at Chapel Hill. That can be a great way to go too when you're local. Sometimes local will tend to get preference, especially if you're an alum, um, right? You graduated from there. Absolutely. Okay, so how does that work? Number one, um, this is like almost like cold calling, but let me tell you what's going on behind the scenes. Find the program that you want to work. So let's say that there's a department of biology and they've got a, a, a whatever, an undergrad degree in this or a graduate degree in that. Like search online, find the program that you want to teach in, um, right? And remember, to teach graduate level, you're going to have to have a graduate degree. Otherwise, you're teaching undergrad. Find a program that you want to teach in and find out who the chair of that program is and email them directly. And, and I'll tell even if there's no job posting, I got contacted a lot this way as a department chair, and here's why it works. Number one, department chairs um, often don't post part-time jobs. They've got their pool of adjuncts, um, and, and the pool kind of sits there, you know, until they understand what their hiring needs are gonna be for a given semester. And so as it's like, oh, we need to add a section or, oh, I got to, you know, so-and-so quit or, right, these needs are come up. There are people that hire, honestly, like the week before the courses start. Sometimes that happens. And so they don't have time to advertise. And so if you, you can actually reach out via email to the person, super short email. You don't want to be annoying. I want to introduce myself. I'm looking for part-time teaching jobs. Um, maybe two sentences about you, right? I've done this work, da, da, da. Here's a link to my digital portfolio, right? Please check me out. And here's my Vita or my resume, whatever you want to attach, okay? 
that's that's the strategy um see if you hear anything back if you don't i'd send it don't take it personally sometimes people are busy especially in large programs where they might be serving hundreds or thousands of students um you're you might also get routed to somebody else maybe the assistant chair actually does the hiring of adjuncts right um, i wouldn't recommend reaching out to deans don't do that it's not going to get you very far definitely contact department chairs um, because usually the hiring happens at that level and so it's kind of cold calling but you're planting seeds just who am i i'm looking and but don't give up the squeaky wheel gets the grease because if i see like I, I've hired many people that were squeaky wheels, right? Because it let me know they were passionate. They'd follow up. They, they're, they'll get the work done. That's how I felt about that energy, right? Like, wow, this person's on their game. Um, and so you might hear back and say, hey, they'll check back with me in six months or check back with me whenever. Um, <clears throat> so that's strategy number three is identifying that um, key decision maker after you've identified the college. It's strategy four is making that personalized contact and then follow up in the annual timing. Um, I'd probably, here's how the hiring works. Usually six months before a course goes live, it's getting put in the calendar um, internally in the university at least six months in advance. So I do, you know, it's like throughout the year, I do six months and then um, they're starting to get their planning needs in place around two to three months before the class begins. And then even a month before the semester begins. So if you really have a specific location where you want to work, just kind of be that squeaky wheel once every, you know, few months, kind of reaching out, get always sharing the beta fresh, always sharing the digital portfolio fresh. People absolutely hire that way. And I hope that strategy works for you. Okay, so let's um, imagine that you've got the job interview and now what? <laughs> or they wanna meet you, right? And we're all meeting online these days. Uh, get online with a friend and please practice your online interviewing skills and whatever. If, if they've sent you a Zoom link, get online and Zoom ahead of time. If they sent you a GoToMeeting link, get online and like go to meeting. You don't wanna be confused about the interface at all. And um, because one of the tips I'm going to give you is to take the lead in the interview, um, please make sure you understand how to share your screen, uh, you know, that the video works, that there's lighting. And by the way, um, set, up your, set up lighting. I've got lamp, two lamps up here in front of me um, to shine light on my face, and I'm sitting in front of a window. The more light um, that you have on your face, it brightens you. Um, and it, well, it does great things to get rid of wrinkles and stuff like that too. So it's just um, prefer, uh, appear professional, appear pre prepared, um, set your lighting. You know, it's, I just use a lamp, it doesn't really matter. Um, and practice your web conferencing with a friend, right? Have them ask you some questions, you respond, and then say, hey, I'd like to take you over to my digital portfolio, share your screen, kind of work through the tools like that in advance. Um, the very first thing when you get on the call with the person before you start talking about yourself is to understand them and their need. So they might open the conversation that way. Let me tell you about the job or whatever. But if they don't, I would turn the conversation there. Hey, it's um, great to meet you, Dr. So-and-so. Thank you for taking the time to meet me. I'm so happy to... Um, share more about myself with you. Could you please give me some background on the position and what you're looking for? Right, you definitely wanna, it's a, it's a basic sales strategy. You wanna get the needs on the table first because then as you're talking about yourself, you can explain how you meet their needs. Um, so please get the needs on the table first. Assume that the person interviewing knows nothing about you and doesn't remember your resume. I'm going to tell you that happened to me a lot. I have hundreds of emails a day, literally. People introducing, I met you here, here's my resume, this, that. It's, it's a lot going on. And so while I may have set up the interview and I looked at your resume two weeks ago, I may have not looked at it again um, right before we got online. And so go into that interview and you're like, oh, I already sent them my resume. I don't want to be redundant or I already sent them a link to my portfolio. I don't want to be redundant. Don't think that way. Just start from scratch and start fresh. 
as I shared with you in my resume or my cover letter, blah, 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 just start and give some um, of your background, share what you're passionate about. Definitely share your passion. Um, and that's what I mean by lead the interview. Really, um, you can take charge in the interview that way to help elicit what their need is. And now I'm going to share about myself and would it be okay? Very polite, right? Would it be okay if I um, just share with you some of my work that I'm proud of on my portfolio? Um, right? And you can lead it in that direction. And then, and then to wrap it up, and it doesn't have to be a long interview. It might be 10 or 15 minutes as an initial you know, conversation. Um, offer to follow in the follow up email. So you're done. You're going to send them a thank you email, obviously. Um, offer though to, would you like to see some of my student evaluations? If you've ever taught anywhere and you have any student evaluations, or um, I'd be happy to send you some letters of recommendation. You want something as a follow up. Um, if you've written an article or a blog post that they might be interested in, some content. I'm during the call, you can say, oh, thank you. I'll send you a follow-up email with a link to my article or a link to my blog or a link to my video. There's some, you want to get some content in there and hopefully the content convinces them that you're a great instructor. Okay. Um, now negotiating your contract. Everybody always wants to know how much money am I going to make um, teaching online? Boy, this really varies a lot. Um, if, if any of you have ever taught online or have talked to an employer who talks online, can you just paste in chat right now, like how much they've offered? Okay, so sometimes the salary um, will be set. It'll be set by the university. It'll be set by the program. Um, and there's no negotiating around it. Some use a salary scale and depending on your years of experience or whatever, you're going to get paid that rate. Um, this was not always negotiable. Like we have guidelines. Um, but for some rock star people that I really, really wanted, yes, I offered them more. Absolutely. Um, and, and so you're going to hear everything like, let's just say a regular semester long course, right? 15 weeks, or maybe it's a condensed, but a semester um, or a full three credit course, like National University um, teaches them in a month at a time, right? Your salary is going to vary probably somewhere for teaching one course, three grand up to, I've paid instructors up to 10 grand. I'm um, really rock star people for teaching a course, right? So somewhere in there, 3,000, 4,000, $5,000. Um, and if you guys have heard different, please uh, let us know um, per course. So it's not going to make you wealthy with part-time teaching. Um, it's a great supplement. Teaching full-time, it's going to be a regular full-time salary, regular full-time benefits. And so that's why um, if you want to go into it, you know, just starting out, maybe you got a side gig or a full-time job and you just want to teach one. How does it feel? Let me get some experience. And then I can transition to full-time. Um, one thing you want to think about in the negotiation is, are you going to have to build the curriculum? Or are they providing the curriculum to you? And that's something that you want to talk about once the offer is made, maybe even on the first call. You know, is there already curriculum built? Because if you have to build a curriculum, that's a lot of work. Um, and if you've never built an online curriculum, you may feel like you're in over your head. I'm going to share some short gap curriculum building strategies with you, though, to even take care of that. Um, so usually pay for the curriculum is separate for pay from teaching. Um, sometimes they're the same. Well, we're going to teach you three grand to teach it and three grand to build it or four grand to build it and five grand. To... So make sure you understand what is the pay covered and the expectations around the pay. Am I just teaching it or am I going to have to go in and build the syllabus and build the lessons and the modules and right? Um, so in, if you do end up having to build it, one of the questions you want to ask, and this would be in the contract probably that you would sign, is who owns the curriculum design? Um, so if you're creating a curriculum for a university, like let's say you build a course called um, Introduction to whatever, Fundamentals of Music. Who's going to own that course content when it's done? Can you, if, if they never hire you again, can they use that course with another instructor? Is that okay with you? right? Then it becomes their IP, intellectual property. Um, let's say you never teach for them again. Can you take the course and go teach it for another university? 
A lot of people do that. A lot of people teach from multiple universities using the same content. So I would encourage you, if you are developing content, um, please make sure that you keep your rights to the content design. Um, you can share rights with them. So those are called non-exclusive rights. You have non-exclusive rights to use my content, right? I'll, I'll build it for four grand. You guys can use it, but please understand I'm going to use this and, and it's mine. I never give away copyright. Um, I don't, I'm not interested in giving away copyright. I keep control over my content uh, because it has value. And so if they're wanting sole control, they better pay heavily for that because you can never use it again, right? You're just basically fee for service. Short gap curriculum design strategies. Hey, we want to hire you, but you have to start on Monday. <laughs> it's like Wednesday. Oh God. How? And there's no content built. Can you get something up? I'm going to give you um, a really quick way to get started in the book that you're going to get a free copy of. Hold on. Let me go back to my Chrome. I get out of that. Here we go down here. Escape. There we go. My escape button wasn't working. Okay. My first tip is to start with a syllabus. I've linked to this syllabus. I just keep it in Google Docs. You're welcome to make a copy of it, uh, download it, edit it, do whatever you want with it. Number one tip when you're building a curriculum, start with your online syllabus, right? And please build in uh, Google Docs or, or Office 365 so you can share the URL. Um, and Sherry's asking a question, so I'm going to answer that. Oh, and Joe, too. Uh, Joe, would you put student evaluations or recommendations on your portfolio without the names of the students? Um, I've done that. I have a page, and I've turned it off, but on my um, Wix website, when I've job hunted, I have a page called Testimonials. And there are references that people have given me or student. Um, it's a combination of student, peer, employer, um, and who said it. I actually say who said it. I get permission. I just ask them, do you mind if I use this as a testimonial on my website? So you can do anonymous testimonial. It has a little more weight when a real person's name is there. And yeah, absolutely. If I'm job hunting, I have a testimonial page. And then um, Sherry, what is your advice if I meet the majority of the qualifications, but one of the qualifications has to do with experience in higher ed, which I don't have. I would encourage you to get experience in higher ed. And so that would be something like, um, uh, can I support you? I, I would use the same strategy. I would reach out to a department chair and or an instructor and say, look, I'm looking to get experience in online teaching in higher ed. I'm wondering if I could work for free as a teaching assistant or support you in some way so I can get a reference and I have something to put on my Vita. People need help all the time. Um, so just to get involved in some project in higher ed, we have people all the time volunteering their, their help. We've had volunteers at our conferences. We've had volunteers in courses. We've had um, can, I can I volunteer to create a webinar for your class? Can I volunteer to, you know, do anything? Um, it's, it's that linkage. It's like that baby step that will show people that you've had some experience in higher ed. I don't know. Maybe it sounds like a lot of work, Sherry. It's really not. You just, you do have to reach out to people though. Sometimes it can come from if you've ever, um, how about past instructors that you might have taken courses from in college? If you're like currently taking things with anybody online, could I be a TA for you next semester? Or could I, I'm looking for, you know, experience on my resume. Can you give me some tips how to build it? Can I work, can I support you in any way? Okay. So back to um, syllabus, sample syllabus, very standard in higher ed. Every syllabus I've ever seen and every department I've ever worked in, you have your course objectives, you have the instructor info, uh, what software and or texts are you gonna be using? What is your schedule, days, times, right? Um, and usually uh, the university will have a template syllabus uh, with some of this lingo down here by law, like they have to have this accessibility stuff and stuff like that. So they may have a template that they give you, but this is your short gap if you have to build a curriculum yourself. Um, number one, start with your syllabus. And then number two, start building out the modules 
and the modules are these things, right? I teach online, I, I have a module one per week. Here's this module, here's this module. You don't have to build the whole thing in advance. You can build one week at a time. So basically you're staying one week ahead of your students. That works fine and you unlock each week as the week comes up. Um, some students don't like that because they wanna work in advance. The advantage to that approach is you can actually design the course around who your students are and what the needs are as they're emerging in real time in the course. So it doesn't take a lot to get, you know, objectives down, course objectives, and then creating activities that align to the objectives. This is simple. And so now let me show you, um, I wanted to bring this up. Let's see if I, uh, shoot, I didn't. I'm going, to sh I'm going to share this with you anyway. This was uh, an old class of mine um, that I taught at Chapel Hill. So let me show you this course. This is this course that, of the syllabus I was just showing you, right? So there's a link to the syllabus. It's embedded. It's an embedded part of the course. No big deal. Go back to the modules. And now I just build the modules week by week by week. Um, and you'll see these um, images aren't working. This course is old, so they're not loading anymore. Um, but again, I've just, I'm using the same template and now I'm just building out the week as I go. What are the objectives? I always focus on the to-do list. Um, we learn through research. I'm studying people who learn online. Just tell me what to do. I'll have all the readings and stuff embedded um, and the resources and the links are all hot linked here, but it's very outcomes based. Um, and if you can kind of lockstep people through um, embed your videos if they've got uh, videos to watch. Um, it's a short gap, quick way. That's all you got to do. Let's say you don't have an LMS. You can build this in Google Docs or Office 365 and share that link, right? So just think week by week, really simple way. Um, if, if a chair wants to hire you, but they don't have a curriculum, okay? Um, okay, and I think... I think I may be at the end. Let's see. Oh no, I've got one more. Getting rehired. I mentioned this at the start of our session. Um, I often didn't rehire adjuncts because they had bad student evaluations. So please let me just talk about that. Um, once you're actually teaching online, you will get student complaints unless you're like a superhero. Even, you know, me, I had five, 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 you know, on a Likert scale of one to five. Students love me, I would get complaints. Students complain, uh, things go badly for people. Um, sometimes people's expectations aren't met. They have tech issues, uh, the links are wrong, whatever the complaints are. Um, okay, so number one, have a supportive kind attitude. So when complaints do come up, you're there to help. Students have your phone number, they have your uh, email, you respond within 24 hours. If there is an issue, you're just responsive to it, right? That's a, that will get rid of 90% of student complaints issues, 95%, 99%. Um, let's say the complaint continues. Don't let it just fester over time. You want to resolve that complaint. Um, and it should be between you and the student initially. Sometimes students will go to the department chair. They'll go above your head or the dean, right, to complain. All the dean will do is bump it back down. And, and the same with the department chair. If the student hasn't tried to work it out with the instructor first, I would send them back to the instructor. Once it gets to me though, as a department chair, now you're on my radar. Uh-oh, is this person gonna be an issue? So before that happens, if you get a student complaint and you can't seem to quickly resolve it, bring the department chair in immediately. Um, like let them know. Hey, Dr. So-and-so, um, this happened. Here's how I'm working on it. Here's the student. If you have any advice, please let me know. Like bring them in as your partner to solve the student complaint because you may find out that the student has complained in other courses or they're just a complainer. There are students like that. Um, and, then the, and then the chair can tell you, oh, you know, it's okay. That person struggles in other courses. We're working with them. Their advisor's working with them, whatever because all college students have an assigned advisor that's not you as the instructor. So that's another strategy is to find out who their advisor is and pull in the advisor. But don't let complaints go over time and don't let them fester. Um, another way that you can work with this is the timing of the course evaluation. 
sometimes that's beyond your control. You want great evaluations, right? We all do. Um, the timing can actually impact you negatively or positively. If you do have timing or control over the timing of when that evaluation is released to students, um, I would not recommend releasing it the week before um, finals are due. Students are stressed to the max. Um, they don't know if they can get the work done. They all have all this stuff in their head, right? And now all of a sudden you're like, please evaluate this course when they haven't completed yet. Um, trust me, your evaluations are not going to be as great as if you waited until after the final projects turned in. They're proud of their work. They're done. Yes, they're feeling good. Before the grade goes out, hopefully, then have them work on the evaluation. Um, sometimes universities do external evaluations, like they're built in the enterprise-wide system. And you won't get the data for six months. You don't know. I'll often run my own little mini evaluation, like I'll create one in Google Forms. And it'll say things like, hey, I know the university is going to send one out. I really, I need your help with that because it helps me get rehired. Um, but I'm just looking for some feedback on the course and on my teaching. And do you mind just filling out this thing? Absolutely, I would do those. Now you've got additional data um, that you can share with potential employers. Share and save good evidence of your teaching. Your students will send you thank you cards. They'll uh, post statements in discussion boards or messaging like this changed my life. Um, uh, oh my God, I had no idea. You've done this for me. You've opened my eyes. Whatever those things are. Uh, or students create really powerful um, projects, powerful learning. Save all that. Um, links to videos, uh, screenshot stuff and create collections of evidence that you can um, incorporate in your portfolio. And then the last thing, and this doesn't sound very nice, does it? Do your job, don't be a whiner, help the team. Positive attitude is everything. It's everything as a part-time employee. Um, department chairs can be selective. There's a lot of people they have to choose from. Just be a good team member. Be, keep a positive attitude um, if you have issues, even in, even in complaining, um, do it positively, you know, like, hey, Dr. So-and-so, I'm, I'm really trying to get this done and I can't, can you help me? Sounds a lot better than, God, these guys in IT are idiots, right? It's just the tone. Um, and offer to help the team. There's a larger team um, that's making this initiative happen. So if you have the time that you can put yourself out there, make that offer to the, to the person that hired you. If I can help you in any way uh, with the program or, you know, uh, please let me know. I'm, I'm here to be a valuable team member for you. That's what I look for. Strong course evaluations, uh, people that didn't complain, um, and instructors that were letting me know. And I would share this evidence, like when something powerful happens, I would forward that email to your chair, right? So they know. It's like you're just sharing the news that things are going great. I do this now with my own dean, like when good news comes along, it doesn't matter if it's, you know, from a donor or a client or a grant or whatever, always sharing the good news uh, with the person that hired you so they can go and share it with their boss. Okay, that's it for me. I did want to mention I started it at the beginning. I shared that I have a class in online teaching strategies that starts next week. Uh, we have scholarships now that are giving 50% off on that course. If you're interested in that, email me. Um, but other than that, my little webinar series is over. And I really thank you guys for engaging with me on it. Do you have any final comments or questions or any conversation that you'd like to have? 